Um, I get very excited about certain guests and not so excited about others. But this next guest is someone, my God, I looked at the biography and I thought, if I don't get to introduce her to the audience, to you, I'm missing a beat. I should be, I'm in the wrong business. Her name is Francesca Emerson. She was born into Harlem and not the easiest life, but she grew into one of the most beautiful and accomplished women in America. And that's not saying enough. Her first husband married her while she was still at school. Then he tried to kill her. She stuck a butcher's knife into the chest of her next lover <laughs> when she found him with two other women. Then she began her career as one of the most outstanding of the Playboy bunnies. And those are legendary women, all of them. But she may be the most legendary. She married her second husband, who was a Californian actor and was swept up in Hollywood. Her many lovers included... Leonard Cohen, the singer-songwriter, mafia mobster Nathan McCullough, and in her new tell-all biography, autobiography, she exposes the amazing world of Between the Sheets Hollywood, and she holds nothing back. I hope she won't today with us either, as she exposes everything and everybody. My God, what a, <laughs> what a bio, and, and that's just the top-line stuff. Francesca, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Oh, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. When you walked in this morning, I, I thought, no, hang on. This has got to be someone who's bringing Francesca because mm -hmm. I, I, I hate to ask a woman her age, but you're proud of it. You're 82 years old. That's I am. My God. Yeah. Teach us your secrets <laughs> and your, your magic. Well, as I said, it really is to live in the moment, to enjoy life. Don't get stressed out, particularly about things you have no control over, you know. And to follow your dreams, follow your passion, just enjoy being who you are and not worrying about taking care of other people and, and worrying about other people. But sort of, I learned this from my children, how to be selfish. So now it's really all about me. <laughs> well, you've, 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 earned, <laughs> you've earned that. Um, yeah. Someone said to me over the holidays, mm -hmm. what would you like people to say about you when you're dying, when you're, when you're dead one day. And I mean, I, I don't know how many of us have these existential questions, but it uh -huh. kind of caught me off guard. Yeah. And I thought long and hard about it. And one of the things that impresses me about people is when they have great stories to tell mm -hmm. yeah. and they're fun to be around and they're yeah. interesting. And I think those could probably be the things that I would want most. And my goodness, you've got that in bucket loads. Yeah. Well, I, I do have some stories, but I think I would like people to remember me as being kind. Right. And being curious and liking people. Uh, you see, I start to grow. I start to grow. Up. Those are much more adult and mature things to you think know, about. So, yeah. But you, I mean, you could never have predicted the life that you have had at the time that you were a young girl in Harlem. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I would have never dreamed in a hundred million years that I would have lived this kind of life. But uh, I have sort of lived it as a, as a, from moment to moment. So when I reflect back on my life, I think that I was really very fortunate and blessed because many doors had been opened for me from the very beginning. From the time I started working at Playboy Club, I walked in as a sort of a young, naive kid, and I walked out of there a mature, confident woman, uh, meeting lots of interesting people, hobnobbing, as I like to say, with the rich and famous, and traveling and making money and being very secure in myself. And as a young kid, I was really a loner, and uh, so I spent a lot of time by myself, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but, I was always, but I was always curious and I was always a reader, and so I was never one of these sort of diffident people. You know, I was always sort of out there. Right. Um, so I don't know where that came from, although my father was, my father, Charlie Barker, was pretty um, uh, an outgoing person. So I okay. probably learned a lot from him. Uh, but I don't know. I just, as I said, I was just very blessed um, with my life because things just sort of fell into my lap. Well, often you meet people who complain about their life and complain about the lack of opportunity they've had or how they were born into poverty or they never had the resources or the opportunities. 
And I think you've almost got the opposite attitude because you say all these doors open for you, but a lot of them you had to kick down yourself. Well, I think that might be true, but I never thought there was nothing I couldn't do. And I think one of the things that really actually changed my life when I was seven years old, and I went with my grandmother who worked as a housekeeper for a Jewish family, and we went up to their summer home in the Catskills. Mm -hmm. And when I got into that house, because uh, I lived, we, you know, we lived in Harlem in a three-story walk up, one room, my brother, my grandmother, and I. And so so when I went, walked into this, this palace, I thought, oh, my God, this is something I had never seen before, you know, as a, as a kid growing up in Harlem. But when I left there, I said, when I grow up, I'm going to have a house like this. And that, that, seeing that, because that was something I didn't seek, because we didn't even go to movies at that time because we couldn't afford to do that. So this was something that I never knew existed until I walked through that door. And then when I walked into that uh, Dr. Bennett's library and I saw all those books on the wall, four to ceiling books, mm. and uh, I knew that there was something there for me. I just knew that this is a place that I should be. And when I got home to my little one room in Harlem, I, I said this I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to have a place like that. Wow. Where where do you think the confidence comes from? Because you you mentioned it in in the opening comments and you've mentioned it again now. Yeah. That that belief in yourself. Well, um, some some people struggle with that their whole lives. Well, I don't know. I as I said I I don't know where it came from. I just do know that I grew up um my brother and I were uh lived like a boarding. We were always uh, shipped out to other family because my father was, my mother died when I was five years old. Okay. And so my father was still a young man, and so he was out sowing his oats. So he put us with relatives who reluctantly took us in. And so, uh, so I always felt like uh, I was alone. My brother and I had to take care of each other. And so I learned just from watching people and seeing how, you know, how they reacted to us and how I could react to them and what, I don't know where I learned it from. It's just something that, that I, I, something that came to me. Well, I, I, I think, I think that that, you know, the sexiest thing in the world is probably confidence. Yeah. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. But yeah. And this is what I tell young girls now when they ask me that question. I said, you have to really believe in yourself. But first of all, you have to know what you want. Right. And of course, the you house. don't. Yeah. yeah, sure. So, I mean, obviously, that's not something you get at five or seven years old. But I knew at seven, I was going to have that house. I knew that was a place I wanted to be. And would you say you fake it till you make it? Well, I don't know about faking it. No, I, I mean, <laughs> if you pretend, to, even if you're not confident, because this is this is something that, a couple of people I've looked up to in my life, they they don't really know, and they often suffer from imposter syndrome, and then suddenly they start believing it themselves. Oh well, yeah, and that's a, well, that's almost some. I agree with you on that. If you be, if you believe the fairy tale long enough, then it becomes yeah. real. Mm. Yes, I agree with you on that. Yeah. So I don't know if that. Well, I guess I could. You could put it that way. Um, I. The other thing was I always thought I was going to die young. Really? You know? Yeah, because – and I had put that – planted that seed in my mind that I was going to die at 23 because my mother died at 23. Oh. And so I never really planned for the future. I never really um, uh, thought what I was going to be or what I was going to do. I, I know, like, for instance – when I was working at Bloomingdale's and this uh, boyfriend of mine said, well, why don't you, and I was complaining, but I had two children and I wasn't making any money and, and how difficult it was for me. And he said, well, uh, why don't you go and uh, apply for a job at the Playboy Club? And I said, Playboy Club? What is the Playboy Club? And he said, well, you know, the, the bunnies. And I said, bunnies? I said, I said, only bunnies I know about are the chocolate bunnies I buy for my children at Easter time. And he just broke out and laughed. He thought that was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> that became your name. Yeah. And so he said, chocolate bunny, that's great. Use that, you know. <laughs> 
So anyway, he actually took me to the Playboy Club for the interview, and I got hired on the spot. And I think one of the reasons that I got hired on the spot, because at the time, there was no black girls working at that club. And I was hired by uh, Keith Hefner, which is Hugh Hefner's brother. Now, that's an interesting thing, that Uh there weren't any African-American women there at the time. Yeah. Do you think that that was because there wasn't supply or demand? Oh, no, absolutely. I think what happened was that that club had already been open a year. Okay. Before I... You were right at the beginning then. Yeah, I was at the beginning. Well, 64. Hmm. So I think there were black bunnies there. Uh, It's a hard job, so I'm sure that not a lot of people ask. Sure. And so I I started a year later, the first of the end of December, January. So I think just there was no black bunny at the time. And so I think that's why they... Hired me and well, I mean, you've got to have other, you know. <laughs> well, I meant well. I you had to go through a training, which was right. very extensive. And actually, what happened was I was not able to hold a tray because I weighed about a hundred pounds, and uh, I was a tiny little thing. Wow. And so uh, after two weeks of training, they I couldn't hold that tray with the drinks and the, and all that stuff. So. They decided that they would put me what they call into concession, which is that I walked around with a cig- cigarettes, cigars, and and lighters, and that's what I sold. And and then I could do the uh, camera, mm. and I could play uh, what they call bumper pool. Uh, and so the club in New York was on Fifth Avenue and 59th Street. It was on five levels, and you had those little tight. Costumes that were customly made for you. He had three inch heels, and so it was a hard job. People think it was glamorous, but basically, you were really uh, high priced waitresses. But that was probably for many people the most exciting place in the world. I'm not talking about you guys because you would have been working there, (laughs) but I I think you know, some guys would have spent their whole month's salary on that one night in the Playboy. Well, they had to become a member or have a key club uh, to get in. But I'm sure, because even my father would come to visit me. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, dad would come and bring his friends. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so, no, yeah, it was it was an amazing time, uh, wow. New York City in, in, the, in the 60s. And from that, I became um, one of the um, um, modeling companies saw me there, and so they hired me, and so I used to go. I actually started doing commercials and which at the time in the 60s for black women was unheard breakthrough. of. So it was definitely was a breakthrough. Uh, and so that was fun. And I remember one of the commercials I did was for a uh, Atari company, and I had on boots, and I was walking all over the boots, and Nancy Sinatra was singing, these boots are made for walking. <laughs> wow. That was you. That was me. And um, that's no small thing. No, no, you know, it's no, become what, like a. It's uh-huh. become like a, a, a. Even people who don't know who Nancy Sinatra is, yeah. they know the song, right. and they would have. Yeah. They would have now known yeah. that yeah. you are the woman yeah. in the boots. Yeah, I was the woman in Amazing. the boots. Amazing. Yeah. So anyway, but there's a lot of things like that. For instance, when I got, I was the first black woman to be initiated in the. The Film Editors Guild 776 in California. Wow. Okay. And what happened was that the government said that the studios had to start hiring minorities. And so there were five of us. There were uh, two black guys, myself, a Mexican guy, and a Chinese guy. And we trained for one whole year at all the major studios. And so I decided that I wanted to be an, a, a film editor. And so I learned all about sound effects, music effects, dubbing, the library. And at the end of that year, uh, I was hired by Universal Studios. And um, I and I was called. I made history there because I was the. Actually, I was the only woman in the editorial department. Wow, okay. So now, yeah, that's I, so amazing. I was considered a twofer. So. Yeah. So not only was I was a woman, but I was black. <laughs> well, you you, you pioneered. There's so many categories. If I just look at your life, uh, you you just shattered everyone's expectations yeah. at almost every yeah. level. Well, it was a well. I must tell you, they didn't they didn't make it easy for me. No, of course not. I'm sure it was really tough. It was extremely tough. 
But I did, I must say, what I did, was able to do, I did work on a couple of major features, uh, feature, uh, feature films. And one was called The China Syndrome, mm -hmm. which started Michael Douglas, Jane Fonda, Jack Lemmon, and, um, and, and that was an amazing, I worked on that movie for a year. And I was, and I was, the, uh, I was the first assistant editor on it. And which actually, if you look, that makes you up, very I, important. Yeah, uh huh. So, and I did, and I do get screen credit for that. Uh, and then the last feature film that I worked on was called um, Ronin, which uh, um, Frankenheimer. Yeah, and um, I'm trying to remember. Car chases. I remember. Oh that yeah, movie. That, oh, was yeah. A, that was it. Well, I was actually the second assistant editor on that. <laughs> Must have been a, a hell of a project, but. When uh, you work at that level, mm -hmm. you, you're actually working with the director and, oh, the, and, the, and the actors and, and the producers. Yeah, right, and yeah, I mean, yeah. that's a senior. No, you're not no. just in some editing suite oh, hi no. hiding away all the time. No, you're on the set. No. Well, sometimes you can go on the set. I met with, uh, when I did um, Don Juan DeMarco with uh, Johnny Depp and, and Marlon Brando, and I used to go on the set a lot because I had to take the dailies and take things over. And I remember I used, would always with Brando and I and I got a copy of his autobiography and I tried to get him to autograph it for me but he wouldn't because it was he it was not he didn't sanction that book so he said oh. he would not autograph them but I had but I actually had fun on the set I had fun on the set with you what know. was Brando like he was fun he was funny he was fun I you know and another movie I worked on for a whole year <laughs> for a whole year. Don Juan DeMarco. Don Juan DeMarco. Yeah, yeah he, mm. I mean, he's one of those people who mm. anyone who got to work with him just was so, so impressed with him. They all, yeah. they all have yeah, like yeah. some amazing, you know, this is my moment with, yeah. with, with Brando. Brando, yeah. yeah so, no, uh, and Johnny Depp too, you know, sometimes. Uh, um, Poor we, Johnny Depp. Don't you feel so <laughs> sorry for him with all the stuff he's been through uh, lately? No, I don't feel sorry for him. Why should I feel sorry <laughs> for him? Are you serious? Look at that Amber Heard. Please. <laughs> All right, so uh -huh. on the set, mm -hmm. you're meeting these people. Mm -hmm. You're obviously, you still are a very attractive woman. You have all this confidence because you've done it all. At this point, you've been in the Playboy Club. Mm. You've, you've got your, ch you know, you, you, you know exactly what you're doing with editing, and mm -hmm. that, that makes you skilled as well. But mm -hmm. you have the guile that some of those people just don't know is coming. Mm -hmm. And you meet these, these people. You must have bowled some of them over. Mm -hmm. You must have met some of these actors and... They must have just been enamored of you. Well, and me of them. <laughs> sure, of course, but you you acknowledge that that's your power, right? Yeah. Well, yes, I had I did meet. And were a lot you a single people, woman at this you, time? Were yeah. you were you single and able yes, to? Yes, I was. Right. Well, yes. When I started working at at uh, Universal Studio, I was single. Yes. And yes, I did. Well, yeah, I would say I, I actually I was pretty aggressive. I must say because I. <laughs> I would see someone and I would go after him, you know. Damn would, right. Yeah, so I would make a point. Oh, I, mm, I like the way you look, you know. Like that little girl wanted that house. <laughs> <laughs> you knew what you wanted. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I did have fun. I must say, I really did have fun, and I didn't really, and I, I must say, I did have the mentality of a man in a sense that, uh, you know, I would grab them, sleep with them, and then leave them. You know. Well, you had seen <laughs> men at their best and worst right. for a while, uh, so you'd yeah. figured out that formula very exactly. quickly. I did. And men are at, we're actually very stupid, oh, oh, so well. <laughs> you can you can pretty much figure out what we want in any situation, exactly. right? Yeah. So you you would meet them. You wouldn't develop romantic feelings necessarily. It would be purely fun. Well, in in most cases, except for with one who was uh, who actually I lived with for fifteen years, who was a. Czechoslovakian director Ivan Passer, mm. who what made him so special? Because he he went out of his way to woo all of my friends. My he loved my children. He he was not a man who just wanted me for sex. Right. So he I could tell him all of my stories. He knew everything about me. He was not judgmental. He was totally open, and so we lived together for for fifteen years. And he was he and his best friend Milos Forman, 
like I got to spend a lot of time with. As a matter of fact, I got to, if in the book, it, I talk about going to the Academy Award for Amadeus. Oh, yeah? And and holding holding the Oscar, you know. Wow. And that thing is heavy. It is. <laughs> A lot of these uh, stars, they... I was surprised at how heavy it was. They use it as a doorstop. Yeah, yeah, it was heavy. (laughs) But anyway, that was... He was the love of my life. And and when we broke up, I was totally devastated by that. Um, So that what so devastated that I... I I went to Australia. I said, I want to get as far away from him as possible. So I I had some... A dear friend who who lived in Australia, and she invited me to come. And I went there for six months. Hmm. And uh, then I fell in love with Australia, and I started going back, back and forth, and then I met my third husband. <laughs> well, we, we'll rewind. I want well, to hear okay, about the first oh, and second. Okay, right, but tell okay. me about the third husband, because you say you met him there in Australia. Uh, well, he's 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 Aussie, and um, I met him, uh, actually I met him at, my 50th birthday party when I had arrived there in 1991. But uh, but as a friend, so I didn't marry him until, God, 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, so. he, he must have been special to yeah. have attracted your no, attention. Well he, well, he was, well, he started out as a friend. No, so he was, he was always a friend, you know. So that can happen. No, 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 definitely can happen. Yeah. Okay. And you happen. stayed friends for a long while before it became romantic. Exactly. Yeah. Mm, that's a warning to yeah. any of those yeah. guys who yeah. think every yeah. relationship <laughs> with a friend. So let's go back okay, to. Let's go. Well, okay. You want ma- to go back marriage, to. Yeah, marriage one and two. Because we can't just gloss over the fact that your first husband tried to kill you. Oh, I know. My I know. God. Yeah. And you know what? He and I are now friends. <laughs> <laughs> we actually talk, Bill Hudson and I, we, and we laugh so hard. We, you know, we. Do Why talk. did he try to kill you? Well, because he thought I was cheating on him. And uh, but we were young. I was eighteen when I got married. Right. And he was twenty three, and he was in the army, and he actually had some mental issues. I'm sure. And um, so he, I don't know, he had it in his mind that. While he was off in Korea, that I was cheating on him. So he just decided one day. What, was he going to shoot you? Well, what happened was he called me, because I was still working at Bloomingdale's, and he called me and said, because we had two daughters, and he said, uh, Debbie has fallen on and hurt her head, and she needs a mother, and I'll come and get you. And I said, fine, but, you know, it didn't sound too, it was, I wasn't sure, it sounded strange, but anyway, so I was in the car, and we, because we lived in Brooklyn, and we were heading towards the Brooklyn Bridge, and and he seemed sort of agitated and very nervous, and I was asking him about the girls, and he said they're they're fine, don't worry about it, and and then I looked back and I saw this um, vacuum cleaner box in the back of the car, and I said, why is my vacuum cleaner box in your car? And he said, that's not a, that's not a vacuum cleaner. I said, yes, it is, and so I. When I turned around and I picked up the box and opened it, opened it up, and there was a rifle inside. And I said, "Oh, oh!" I said, "So what is this?" And of course, he didn't answer because he knew what it was. <laughs> and he said, "Then he said, uh, he said that's a a rifle. And I'm going to kill you with it." And I said, "Oh, oh!" Was very calm. I said, "Oh, and 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 why and why do you want to do that?" <laughs> and he said, because you're, you're a whore, you're a bitch, and you've been cheating on me. And he just went off into this rage. And I realized then at that moment that my life was in danger. Right. And I knew I had to be calm. And so I just sat there and let him rage on. And the car had to stop for a traffic light. There were four or five cars in front of us. I just opened that door, got out of that car, and I started Man. running. And I ran as fast as I could. I found the nearest metro station, train station. I got on it. I went to Brooklyn to my father's house, and the girls were there. So he had at least, at least enough sense. To leave them to, with your dad. To, to leave them with my, my, my father and, and stepmother. 
And so then we, my, they took me back to my house to get some clothes and the girls' clothes. And on the table was a, a note saying, a suicide note saying that he was going to kill me and kill himself. And so then I called the police, and because he had already been discharged from the army on a, on a, uh, on a, I want to call it a section, whatever it was, but because he did the same thing there, he barricaded himself in one of the barracks. He took one of the officers' uh, guns and he threatened to shoot himself. So eventually, they talked him out of it. They sent him back home. They put him into a psychiatrist hospital somewhere to, you know, and what do they call it? OP, o- a PTSD. Right, exactly. Which yeah. at that time, they didn't even they know didn't know it. Yeah, they yeah, didn't know that exists. You, and know? Uh, you can only imagine how many people who were in the armed services yeah, yeah, at that yeah, point yeah, yeah. had been exposed Both to in war, war zones. You know, no one, yeah, yeah. there was no psychologist to come around and right, help yeah. you. Yeah. So anyway, so I think that was that was probably part of the issue, you know. How so, long did it take you to forgive him? Oh. I mean, he's the father of your okay, children. Okay, well, you know? I would say probably the last 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, so yeah, it took a last, long time. Oh, it took time. a long time. Well, the thing is, we had a cha- We had two children together, and one of our daughters was, uh, was schiz- is, is, that was, she is schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's in a, a, in a, in a home. She's a, a ward of the state. And so when I was getting ready to move to Australia, I said, you know, I've been taking care of your daughter for the past 30, 40 years, and I think it's your turn to take care of her. And that's So that's how you made contact that's again. That's how we got. But he obviously didn't kill himself. So when you got you saw the suicide note. Mm-hmm. Well, I knew, well, that's when I called the police. Right. And that's when they came and so what happened was the fu- the next day he actually came back to the apartment, and that's where he was arrested. Arrested, and then when they did an interviewed him, they realized that there was he had some issues, and that's when they sent him to the hospital. But he didn't go to jail. No, he didn't go to jail. No, no. That's incredible. And you say you get along with him now, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you 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 gotta you gotta just go into this a little bit for me <laughs> because, I mean, it seems to me like. He should be the one who's like desperately sorry, and I'm sure he's had time to think about these things. And who knows? Oh no, he's therapy. apologized. So you know, he's remarried. He had four other children. And when I wrote this book, the oldest daughter read it, and she was really upset. And she called me up and said, "How dare you talk about my father like this?" And she talked to him about it, and he said to her, "He said." Um, She's telling the truth, and he and he said, "You better be glad I didn't kill her because otherwise you wouldn't be here." <laughs> Absolutely right, and yeah. uh, this yeah. is this is truth for him as yeah. it is for you that yeah. y- y- your life is your life. Yeah, there's no point in hiding from it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and I must say, you know, it, we went out just recently about a year ago. His oldest daughter, my child, his uh, daughter from his second marriage. And we were at some nightclub drinking, dancing, having How a great fantastic. time together. And his other daughter kept introducing me to her friends who came in. This is his first wife. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. So I keep wanting to say Franny, but Fran- you can call me Franny. I can call you Franny. You can call me. A lot so, of people so call me Franny. Yeah. You were the you were the chocolate bunny, but even yeah. before that, now we, we're still looking at the first marriage. Then we go to the second marriage. Now, how how did you get to a situation with this guy where you had to stab him in the chest with a butcher knife? Oh no, no, that's not a, that was not a husband. <laughs> not a husband. No, this was a relationship. This that, was a lover. Oh wow. Yeah. Tell me that story. <laughs> I mean, people are going to have to buy the book. I'm not going to. We're not giving everything away. Okay, no, no. Tell he, me what no, you can. No, he's the lover who took me to the Playboy Club to get. He was. Oh, the same he, guy yeah, who met you at Bloomingdale's. He, right, and said, he was uh, Turkish. Um, huh. he, God, he was handsome. He was a civil engineer, and I met him at the Palladium. I was out with one of my girlfriends, dance, going to a dance, and he approached me at this little at the Palladium and asked me to dance, and I was a little nervous, and but he was a great dancer and. And anyway, so we started seeing each other. And at that time, because I was working as a bunny, I had I worked because I was over 21, so I worked nights. And then I, because I was modeling, I was going on interviews during the day. So, I, you know, so I was you very... You weren't getting any sleep, sleep at all. Exactly. 
And plus I had the children because the, the husband, or soon-to-be ex-husband, was in a psychiatric ward. Right. And, my, and his mother was taking care of my girls for me. And so I, I went out, and so I met this man and sort of fell in love with him, you know, what one thought was love at the time. Sure. So, but basically, obviously, it was on the rebound. And, I, and anyway, as you said, it's in the book, so we don't want to go into all the reasons why, he, but he deserved it, <laughs> you know. But I will tell you this story, and I don't think I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no, well, he did. He did. And, and he Son of said, a bitch. You didn't kill him. Though. No, I didn't kill him. But, you know, the thing was, he said to me, they said that had the knife been uh, an inch to the left, it would have went through his heart. I said, what heart? I said, you don't have a fucking heart. What are you talking about? <laughs> So it ended badly, is what you're yeah. saying. You well, know? no, actually, I saw him too. Not too. We, I haven't seen him in about... 15 years, but he did come to California to visit me because he remarried. He married and had a daughter who was deaf. Oh. And there was a big uh, deaf college in North, somewhere in California. He came, and so I went out with, I met his daughter, went out with him. Did he, did he show the scar and you said that was me? No, 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 he didn't show the scar, but I, he did. I do remember he did have the bloody shirt. Oh, that he hung up like a flag in his house. That when you came to the house, it would be flowing <laughs> like a flag, you know. Is that uh, the only way to break up with a Turkish guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I didn't. Seriously, do you think I thought about it? Do you think no. I actually thought about he it? He must when have I pushed you up, to the brink. When brain. I picked up that knife, when I, and after I thought about it, I thought, woman, are you absolutely mad, crazy? <laughs> you could have gone to jail, you know? But anyway, <laughs> it's. Um, yeah. So Adam Suleiman. Wow. Yeah. So the uh, the list of of of, of lovers. I oh, mean, we got some yeah. we yeah. got some luminaries here. Yeah. And as you say in the in the autobiography, you don't leave anything. No. You you I tell you, it all. You tell it all yeah. because also yeah. you've realized like what do you got to lose? Well, I must tell you, my children were my son. It because he, he it took him a month to get through it. He said, "Mom." Oh. He kept calling me up, "Mom." <laughs> What, horrified? <laughs> yeah. Shocked? No, def- horrified and shocked. Mom. Yeah, anyway, so he was not too, He, you know, but anyway, but he's the son, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. He's, he doesn't want to know that these was things the whole, about his mom. No, he doesn't want to know. As a matter of fact, he just turned 57, and one of the uh, one of the things he said to me that he didn't care if I had lovers, but they couldn't be younger than him. <laughs> so then one day I had to tell him that I had crossed the line. Ah. <laughs> ah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so let's okay. look at this. Okay. So we got right. Michael Douglas. Mm-hmm. He, well, Michael Douglas was um, my producer on the on the China Center, hmm. and who I met at the Cannes Film Festival. But be, but I met him at the Cannes Film Festival before. How did you know? So was he leaning over you the whole time, going, mm, "Franny, that looks really that's a that's no, a great no, no, edit." No, 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 no. But again, it's, it's all in the book. It tells you. I actually met him on a yacht in at yeah. the Cannes Film Festival. This is Festival. very romantic. Yeah, you know, I met him on a yacht, and um, Harold Robbins' yacht. Wow. And I we laughed so hard because when I was on that yacht with my best friend, I said I always thought yachts were big. <laughs> it's kind of insulting. And then she said, "No, well, because it was a, to me it was a tiny little boat," and so I looked it up, and it said yachts could is a a sea vessel that could be uh, any size. And I said, oh, like some of my men. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. Warren Beatty. I mean, isn't isn't he the guy that the song You're So Vain's about? I mean, that's what everybody says. So he was a real catch. Oh, well, but I didn't go out with Warren Beatty, though. But you knew him. Oh, yeah, well, I knew him. I knew he... Also in the book, and I don't want to tell that story. You just have to get the book. To You're read teasing it. us. Yeah. This no, is you no, good no, at this. Seriously, man. What's the all right, point? All right, all right, all okay. right. I'm telling you. A, well, enough, tell me about tell uh, me about Jack Lemmon then. Oh, Jack Lemmon was fantastic. He was he. We went the four of us, all of us: Jack Lemmon, Jane Fonda, Michael Douglas, myself, the editor David Rollins. Rollins. 
we spent a weekend together because they were showing the film, previewing the film. And we had a mini bus, and they put in a grand piano in it, because, you know, Jack plays. <laughs> and he would play the piano and sing songs and... He was terrific. He was funny. I, you know, so it was like a we were like a family for That's for inc- three or four days on incredible. the road. Incredible. Yeah. What a story. Yeah. <laughs> Out of all of these people, was there anyone who just impressed you so much? Uh, you know, because it, famous people are people, and the more you get to know them, the more regular they seem. But are there? Are well, like, the you, only person that really impressed me was Lenny Cohen. Oh. Wow, I mean, I meant, I meant Lenny Cohen. Genius, right? I meant genius. When I saw him, I thought, "Oh my God, Lenny Cohen!" I said, "I meant I was all." I, he must have thought I was some crazy woman. Ah, uh, but no, he, he, he. I would say he would have been the most besides Yvonne Passa, of course. But that was a, the love of my life. But no, as as a as a musician, as a person. And he was he was fun. I had a good time with with Lenny Cohen in the book. You've seen a lot of these people come and go, <laughs> mm-hmm. and you're still here, and you're fit and healthy oh, and looking yeah. good as ever. Mm-hmm. Um, is it sad when you lose these people who are such a an interesting part of your life? Yes. Or do you just carry on having new adventures? Because it seems that way. No. Well, first of all, I am sad at the moment, but we all die. So I don't, you know, I, I don't. Doesn't look like it's on the cards for you anytime. I don't so. linger on death. I linger on life, and living, and so and hoping that they are all in a better, a better place. place. Yes. All right. So, <laughs> so you're you're also, and I, I want to be serious for a second here because okay. you're also a sculptress, <gasps> an artist. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I wouldn't. Yeah, I guess I took welding actually. <laughs> That's uh, that's a hardcore thing for a woman to do. Well, I know, and it's interesting because when I was in Sydney, I was going to uh, welding school, and I was the only woman in the class. I'm sure I was the only black woman in the black person in the class, and as my teacher said to me, the only grandmother. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, so no, I did. Um, yeah, I loved welding. I uh, I did make a few couple of major big pieces, nothing that they're for the house, but... Um, but that's fantastic. No. What an expression of, of, you know, everybody has to have more than one thing that they're good at. Oh, no. Well, I'm good at a lot of things. As a matter of fact, I just started taking up ceramics. Really? So I've been making my own dinner plates. So I've got a set of 10 black ceramic plates with my initials in it. Gorgeous. And so I've had a few people for dinner, and they said, God, we're never... Eaten on on handmade plates before, <laughs> um, so I've made uh, salad bowls and cups and. Is it important? And we're starting a new year. Uh-huh. Is it important to do something new every year? Is no, it is no, it something it, you 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 just find things that you're interested exactly, in? You don't set goals. No, absolutely not. When, when they said, "Do you make a a goal for for New Year's?" No, why? Because we don't keep them anyway. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so I don't talk about, you know, losing weight or doing this. No, I I'm just looking grateful for every moment morning that I wake up. But Franny, I mean it, <laughs> it's not just me being complimentary. You mm-hmm. you look spectacular. Oh, what thank what you. is the secret to that? And I'm not being facetious here. There are people who I've met who are 20, 30 years your your junior who mm-hmm. who look like they've been through the <laughs> And you've actually had an incredibly interesting, busy, crazy life. Yeah. And age hasn't clung to you. How have you got that right? Well, I think it has to do probably my mom and dad. I would think. It good has genes? To, I would say good genes, hereditary for sure. Because my brother, who's a year younger than me, also looks young. And my daughter, who just turned 63, we call her Lolita because she looks like she's 12. Wow. <laughs> she's just turned 63. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but you don't have like an exercise regimen. I mean, you were talking oh, about yeah. Jane Fonda, but I do walk. You know, every Jane Fonda day. earlier. She's in her eighties, yeah, and but she she's also. Had, but she's had a lot of cosmetic she, surgery, yeah, a lot of too. work. <laughs> but she looks, she looks. But she good, still looks fabulous. But yes. not like you look good. I mean, oh. she's wearing a lot of makeup. We've seen her in the movies. Yeah. She's, you know, and and there's a there's a thing that oh. a lot of these women in Hollywood, in particular, you'll know they've had mm. a lot of work, and sometimes it 
doesn't help them. Well, it has to do with, as I said, again, stress. We, we stress about stuff we have no control over. And I don't know, I learned at an early age that too, because I had those two girls, I was working, I had, I was doing a lot of j different jobs, and I was always worrying about how I was gonna pay the rent, how I was gonna get them to school, how I was gonna do this. And in the end, it all, somehow it all worked out. I don't know how, but it all worked out, I said. So I stopped stressing about stuff, particularly stuff I have no control over. You know, like people worrying about sitting, standing in the, the line at a bank and bitching and complaining about the airlines, sure. the airport. I thought, guys. What just, are you going to do? Yeah, you, you know. Just okay, well, there's a good, <laughs> there's a good lesson for all of us. Um, but, but no kind mm. of like. Skin routine or no, no, doing this but now or doing that. as I now that I'm older, I do use a lot of moisturizers. Yeah, so I'm 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 moisturizing up because my skin is dry. So, but no, I walk. I try to walk every day. You know, I have my little watch, so I do my you know my ten thousand steps. steps and, That's impressive. And so I walk. Um, I don't do I seriously I don't do much. You know, I I said I said I have young lovers that sort of keeps you in shape too. How young? Well, my latest boyfriend, well, I won't even call him a boyfriend. My latest lover is uh 45. Amazing. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. And so everyone said, "Well, does he know how old you are?" And he cuz he asked me that question and I said, uh I said you don't really want to know. And he said, yeah, I do. I said, well, I'll tell you this. I'm over 60. <laughs> <laughs> That's vague enough. I like that. Now, you brought it up a few times mm -hmm. in this conversation, and it's it's not a small deal. Mm -hmm. But as the first black woman to do a number of things, mm -hmm. and you did yes, a number of I things. Did. And growing up in the 60s, mm -hmm. you know, the civil rights era was in its full force then. Yes. But America was a very different place to, to what it is now. Absolutely. And a lot of young people now take for granted the things that, you had that, that and, we were the and, and women and like yeah, yeah that you had to struggle for absolutely and you know South Africa obviously at the time we were going through our own mm -hmm. like really terrible yeah. racial segregation and I mean there was there still is in yeah. many parts of the world right. a, a huge mountain to climb there mm -hmm. but I think it's worth hearing your comments on that because you are an activist and you're an activist in in thought but in deed. You did things that well, moved, moved yeah, the but, clock. but not an activist in the way, and politically. Uh, I still am. A, there's two things I really don't talk about is religion and politics. Good for you. <laughs> That's what's kept you young. Okay, so I don't even get into that. I'm right. just a person who uh, uh, I want, I try to do unto others as I want them to do unto me. I try to be um, helpful. A kind. That's my whole thing. I want to be a kind person, yeah. kind to everybody. Everybody I meet on the street, I want to say hi, smile at them, and and treat them with uh, uh, with uh, 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 com compassion and empathy. Um, and that's all. That's what. That's all I do. I said I can't save the world. I know there's a lot of, you know, my heart goes out to, you know, the people of Gaza, but sure. uh, and and uh, and you know around the world in the earthquakes in Japan and whatever's happening. Uh, but I know there that that is something that I can't make a difference. And, but I can make a difference with you, that one person, to change how they think about people of the world. And I know that's, that I'm very good at that. You're right, you are. <laughs> the Chocolate Bunny, uh, what made you decide to write the book? Oh, because um, I was, I was realized that I didn't know, knew nothing about my uh, ancestors, my grandmothers. For instance, my father never talked about his mother, which would have been my grandmother. So she died, you know, um, and so I, so I did my DNA. Okay. And I found out that I was from uh, Cameroon and Benin, and I thought Benin, oh great, I'm a, I, that's where I get that. Uh, that warrior princess from, you know. And so I decided I was going to start with me, that I could leave a legacy for my children, my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, so that they would know where they came from because they would know where I came from. And so I do talk a little bit about my father, but the book really is about me 
for my children. Amazing. <laughs> and for the rest of us, we get yeah. the benefit of it too yeah. from yeah. from hearing this incredible yeah. life and these incredible mm-hmm. stories. Yeah. So if, if you had, you did say earlier, like for young girls when they come up to you and ask for advice, mm-hmm. whether it's family or friends or people who know you mm-hmm. by reputation, maybe they've read the book, um, what, what kinds of things would you tell people besides be kind, besides, you know, try not to worry about the stuff that you can't and control? And yeah. Well, what else can you tell them? Is that good enough? That'll keep you happy. Well, I meant... In the end, each individual have to decide what is good for them. They have to make that choice. I mean, I, I'm just saying that what's what what is good for me. And it, it sounds and it like works. good universal advice. So, it exactly. does sound good. So I think for young girls, for sure, because growing up, young girls are trying to follow the pack. So rather than following the pack, make your own path to follow. <laughs> You're not on social media, or are you? Oh, I am. Actually, I should tell you that. Yeah. So Francesca Emerson on Facebook. Very good. The Chocolate Bunny book on Instagram. Great. <laughs> Be following that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, those are that's, my... That's terrific. Yeah. And are you very active on there? Oh, absolutely. Do you like it? Do you like I the lo- engagement, oh, the interaction? I, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm having... And I must say, I love South Africa. Oh, yeah. Tell me, tell uh, me what, I, I, what brought uh, you here. This well, is a, It's cool for us, but well, why are you here? What brought me here is uh, some dear friends, my two friends who I came with, Victor and Wayne, who I've known about 40 years. Also know uh, Getchy Sabina, who lives here in yes. Johannesburg. And he won about 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, They she has a, a family who lives in Atlanta. And they were there, and then they came to visit me, because I live now in uh, Selma, Alabama. Right. And they came. What a place to live, by the way, oh, in terms well, the of like history was symbolic. Made. Oh, yeah. please. Right. Yeah, so I Selma. Can, yeah, there's a lot going on in Selma. And I'm talking about that, I've made history there too. Um, and so they have been inviting me to come and visit for Beautiful. since 2008. And so I finally was able to make it happen this year. And I am so grateful to be part of that family. She has made this happen. She has taken me in like, uh, well, she, I, she could actually be my daughter. Wow. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just loving it. So I've been to Johannesburg. Uh, I've been to um, I just to Cape Town, and I just got back from Durban. So I've visited the three biggest cities in the country. Well, uh, you're <laughs> you're very welcome here, and and uh, as long as you stay, I'm sure people will be thrilled yeah. to meet you. Okay. Well, thank Even you if they don't that. know who you are, I oh, mean, you walked in you. here, and everyone was suddenly <laughs> swarming around you. There's a charisma that you just can't deny. So you mentioned Selma. Uh, are you going to tell me that the I have a dream, his dream came true when he met you, <laughs> Martin Luther King? <laughs> well, I, have never, I, did, I never met Martin Luther King, but uh. I've been living in Selma for almost 22 years. Mm. And when I arrived there, um, I was a single mother with two girls, two teenage girls. And so I knew that I needed to, uh, it was a small town from Los Angeles, I came from Los Angeles to uh, to uh, Selma, and it's so funny because my dad had bought a house there, and when he died, he left me the house and the mortgage, of course. <laughs> but so when I packed up, uh, I said to everyone, I, oh, I said, I'm moving to Alabama, and all my friends in California said, what are you drinking and what are you smoking? Uh-huh. But I rented a <laughs> 26-foot truck, and we took us seven days to get to Selma, and my daughter said to me, she said, Mom, I didn't know you knew how to drive a truck. And I, by the time I got to Texas, I was a truck driving mama. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> and so Selma, I when I crossed that Pettus Bridge, crossed that Alabama River, I felt like I was home, you know. And so Selma is my, well, Selma and Sydney are my two homes. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. Because those feelings, you mm. you, you know, when. If a place gives you a feeling, yeah. it's for a reason. Yeah. No, I definitely feel at home there, and, and I have made a lot of friends there. Uh, and I think I have made a difference of how they see, uh, as a matter of fact, someone said to me, well, how do you adjust to Selma? I said, no, Selma had to adjust to me. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're the kind of person who walks into a room and everybody notices. Yeah, so I said, I, I, you know, I said, it never dawned wow. on me because I actually, great. I joined a church where I was the first, talking about, we're talking about first again, I was the first black person to be baptized there. Oh, really? And the story was, they, one of my neighbors said to me, oh, what church do you go to? And I said, well, I go to the First Baptist Church. And she said, oh, well, I go to the First Baptist Church, too. And she said, I haven't seen you there. And so we worked it out that I went to the first white. Oh, Baptist. You didn't know. I had I had no idea. Not a breaking clue. new ground in Alabama. I no had less. no idea there were two <laughs> First Baptist churches, one white and one black. Oh. And she said to me, "Well, do you know that they used to stand out on the front steps of that church to keep black folks from coming in?" And I thought about it, and I said, "Well, no, I didn't know that." I said, "But I do know when I walked through that front door, I was welcome." <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, but I got yeah. So Selma, yeah, I got some beautiful stories about Selma, but yeah. And you don't have any uh, prohibitions in your own life against drinking or smoking or any of that stuff, because oh, I mean, no. having been in the club at, at, at oh, no, in your twenties, no, no, honey, I love to drink. I have a, I, I, I'll have a martini every night. Actually, that's uh, Sitting out on my front porch. Damn I'm right. a great cook. Mm. Uh, I love people, so I make. I know how to make bread. Um, you know, I'm. I there's very few things I don't know how to do. <laughs> it it is evident in abundance with you. Listen, I have to tell you, you you're such a delight, mm-hmm. and I hope you have the best time here in South Africa. Oh, I, I I've, well, I'm leaving on Wednesday, so I've been here almost five weeks. It's a good. That's and a good holiday. I've seen everything. I must tell you. Um, I've been to all the museums of Apartheid Museum, the District Six. Um, I like the earrings and the headdress. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, well, I'm I tell, I'm a, I'm a Zulu queen. There you are. <laughs> you absolutely are. Yeah. You're a queen. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. Um, and good luck with the book. Thank you. I, I will be reading it. Okay. The Chocolate Bunny oh, right. by you, Francesca mm-hmm. Emerson, and That's what uh, what a great story this is, Francesca. Thank you so much. Okay, I love you. What a pleasure to me. I love you too. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>